Just a TLDR for people tuning in. Uh, I coached him several weeks ago. He's from League, and uh, he's about, you were 2.5K, right? Um, yeah, around there. Okay. And he basically, I thought his mechanics owned, so it looks like a lot of his like lane mechanics were pretty good. And he straight up was not buying items. He like straight up was not using the courier and uh, not buying to like win his lane. So he was basically trying to win his lane with Brown Boots Bracer at like nine minutes into the game. So I basically told him we're going to cut this session in half. Uh, I told him to queue up the next item he's going to buy, play to win his lane, shove the tower, and constantly make himself stronger and stronger as an offlaner and see where that takes him. Because I feel like I have to at least watch him do that to... You know, have him learn anything more. Banana slam, giant. Here we are today. My question for you is not necessarily has it like helped you gain MMR, but does it feel like the game is any different to you, or does it not really feel any different? Uh, it feels a lot easier <laughs> when I actually remember to buy um, the items. I've gotten a lot better now, but. Um, the main issue I have say, is that since I was, I've been basically only playing Axe and Tide, I, sometimes I just get, some lane matchups are just like unplayable and I've kind of learned that from trial and error. So, yeah, that's exactly. So the whole point that I wanted you to do is that you'll, by buying items that make you strong, there's a lot of things that you learn. First off, you can kind of learn what makes each individual hero in the game strong, you know, Different heroes need different things. Some heroes need move speed, some heroes need damage, some heroes need sustain, you know, all types of different things the heroes need. So it'll teach you to, like, by trial and error, you'll see whether or not an item made you strong. That's, like, a big thing. And then on top of that, you can also gauge if you try to itemize as strong as possible, some lanes are just so bad that you can't win them. So um, that is a lesson that you are meant to learn. So sometimes it is incorrect to itemize to be strong because if you itemize to be strong, but you're still weak, usually that means you're just wasting money. Like usually you're just putting money in that doesn't really serve a purpose. So with that in mind, uh, do you have a few replays that we can check out and see, you know, what, what's going on with you? Yeah, I have this one from today that um, I felt like we did pretty well and I did pretty well in lane, but then we ended up losing either way so because mainly because um they had a pango and i just didn't know how to deal with him when he ulted yeah pango is quite an obnoxious fucker so you are the tide hunter here yeah yeah i was playing with the three stack of this game and i played with the tuscan lane yeah it's a pretty strong lane tusk tide minus armor physical damage so has, has it impacted your game like your mmr at all or are you still kind of stuck no i'm I'm pretty stuck, but I've realized it's because I mainly don't know what <laughs> most heroes do and like what items to buy because I'm just lost and sometimes I you're just buying items but they're not the, the right items. Things. I see. Yeah, I'm just autopiling and buying the same things pretty much. Okay. What we'll talk about is some indicators, not necessarily specific heroes, uh, but hopefully some overarching themes to talk about um, with your itemization. Okay, so that'll be goal. Like you know, I have different ways I talk about items for every MMR. Even though I think you're mechanically skilled, your your conceptual knowledge is definitely um, just not there, and it's just because of lack of experience with Dota. So that that's totally fine. Uh, it's not something you should, you know, feel bad about or whatever. So, um, let's see. So your Tusk gets the pull off. Let's just fast forward here. So, uh, I will say first and foremost that. I don't think you're buying, like, you're flying yourself your items soon enough. So, generally speaking, it's very few games where you will buy, like, your entire phase boots in one go. Okay? Uh, the reason why TLDR is so much can happen in the span of time that it takes you to get 1,450 gold or whatever, that if you wait until you buy your entire phase boots, usually something's gone wrong prior to getting the phase boots. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, if I'm sitting on items, they'll probably have an item up on me or something. Yeah, just in general, it's more so that in Dota, you can plan like 30 seconds to a minute ahead in terms of like exactly what the lane's going to look like. 
but if you buy an item, that means you assume what's going to happen for like the next four minutes, because that's how long it's taking you to get these phase boots, okay? So you, by buying these phase boots outright, you're basically not accounting for anything that happens between two to six minutes. Like you're just ignoring everything that's happening. And that's fine in terms of when we're getting you used to buying items, but that's not fine once you're buying items and we need to talk about your items. So the way Dota works is that you need to, I mean, I'm assuming League is probably similar, but I don't know. Um, you need to think, you need to learn to just be aware of what's happening to you. So there's like a, um, let me make sure I get this right. So let's just talk about this. How many games of Tide have you played since like we last talked? Um, maybe 12, 13. I've played more Tide than Axe, but I, I played like a total of about maybe 35 games and more than half were Tide. Okay. So yeah, you 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 played a lot of Tide. So what that means to me when you're playing Tide is that you're going to settle into a way that you like to play Tide, okay? Everyone's a bit different. So I guess the first question I would ask you is like why didn't you level Gush? I'm just asking. Uh I just suppose he would just uh, jump, that the void would just jump and then it would be I wouldn't do anything else. Okay. With my gush. So, do you always skip gush, or do you level gush sometimes? I level gush when I'm pretty sure I can kill someone. Like if, like I'm, like if I would have seen the the hoodwink a bit closer, I would have leveled gush, and then I would have told my friend to go on him. Okay. And maybe try to kill. Him. Okay. So I'm just trying to I'm trying to like in, enter your mind a bit here. Okay. So we're just gonna talk. We're gonna use Tide as like a vessel to teach you at least basics of what I would want you to to iron out here. So you, what I'm gonna say is that you're you're giving me enough enough critical thinking about your skills that you seem to have a general idea of, like, the types of lanes Tide can be in, okay? Like, sometimes you're in kill lanes, sometimes you're kind of playing, like, the farm war, where you're just maxing out your anchor smash and your kraken shell, and sometimes you're, like, in the, you know, uh, what do you call it? You're on life support, where it's, like, a shitty-ass lane, you're against some slark or monkey king or something, and you're not enjoying yourself. So... Either way, it sounds like you've critically thought about this enough, so I'm not too concerned about that. So now what we say to you is that you need to trust what you're doing is correct, okay? Like, for now. So what I'm saying is you have come to a conclusion about how you're going to play the lane. And you need to let that kind of carry you. How much during the game are you thinking about this? Or is it kind of just playing itself out? I actually just need to know. How much mental effort... Does it feel like you use to do what you're doing in this lane? Actually, in this lane? Like um, playing the lane out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like is it Not new... that much. Go, go it ahead. just, yeah, I pretty much spend most of my time like thinking what to buy. So in lane, I kind of just autopilot. The whole sequence that you saw that I was behind the tower is because my friend told me, Let's just cut the wave and pull it to the neutral camp. And, so you wouldn't and, have done that on your own? Like, do you do that sometimes on your own? Or is that something that purely is from him telling you? Um, only if I'm pretty confident, but I don't, like, know the damages yet. So the dam, I didn't know, I don't know what to expect from a hoodwink. So I don't, yeah. since I don't want, I know what to expect from him, so I usually just respect most uh, heroes until I actually get to... Like, if he hits me or something, and then I realize, oh, he doesn't do damage, so maybe I try to go. But if I, since I don't really know, I just kind of, like, try to be a bit passive. Okay, so I think what you can do in that regard is you need to recognize what, like, the more efficient plays and aggressive plays are for you. So, like, if you're a hero like Axe and Tide, you have spells that it doesn't matter how many creeps there are, you, you, you kill them all, right? So if you're playing to farm, you would like to have as many creeps around you as possible, which is why Tusk is like telling you to cut the creep wave and stuff. So the only reason why you wouldn't do it is because those opponents kill you. And it sounds like you have come to this conclusion, which is good. But what I'm going to tell you is 
I, at my level, don't always know whether or not that opponent will kill me in a given situation, okay? Like, I've played 18,000 games of Dota or some shit, okay? So what I'm saying to you is that the times that I go behind that tower is that I know it's the efficient play, and I don't know whether or not I'll die. I don't think I'll die, okay? Like, for me, it's, like, obviously a much more specific thought process of exactly how they're going to kill me and stuff. But for you, I just need you to guess, man. Like, I actually, if you are not sure whether or not they can kill you, I need you to play efficiently. Like, I need you to play aggressive. Like, cutting behind their tower, doing all these things that your tusk is telling you to do. Like, you'll kind of learn it from playing with your friends. Like, what aggressive plays are and, like, what efficient plays are and stuff. And if you aren't sure whether or not you're going to die, just do it. Because that's the only way you're going to learn whether or not you're going to die. Okay? Um, I would rather you feed not like and learn how you died meaning like you feed because the hoodwink you know killed you and you didn't know that she was going to do that and learn how she killed you and then you can learn from it it's like what if hoodwink kills you because she shackled you to a tree maybe you want to run it back next time and avoid the trees you know but you didn't really maybe you didn't know that hoodwink stun works with trees like that's something that you're gonna have to learn so either way i want you to embrace that mindset that if there's a more aggressive play that you know you're capable of making regardless of what their heroes are and you're not sure <laughs> that it's going to work go for it okay just go for it you just have to take my word on it it's going to hurt in the short term because you're going to have to learn some lessons the hard way but in the long term it's going to help okay um because it go try ahead. to play efficiently like try to play always efficiently and then see what happens yeah scale it back yeah. based on what happens to you yes exactly so it's much okay. easier to learn your limits that way than it is to like play conservatively i've had plenty of students that get stuck at like 3k mmr after thousands of hours of dota because they are not willing to push their limits so they just don't know what they are they, re they just don't know what their limits are so it's something where it hurts in the short term like i said you're going to stomach some feeds and losses because you lost your lane because you fed but in the long term, you'll really learn what you get away with. And that's how you start to abuse efficiency and people like uh, not being able to punish you and stuff. So, okay. So that's the first thing is combination of trusting your gut in terms of the way you've played these lanes. Like, I think what you're doing in this lane is completely reasonable. Like, none of it's perfect, but it's I don't think it's your core issue. Like, I think your laning mechanics are still above 2K. So now... We're going to turn our attention to, like, how you're supposed to itemize, okay? So I need you to watch this game because you're not... I asked you how hard it was, like, mentally to play this lane because I needed to know if you had any leftover space. So you told me, and I'm just clarifying, if I ask you, like, what does most of your mental energy go towards in the game, like, what is it, like, in the lane? Is it just purely thinking about buying items and what they are? Is that what it is? Yeah, because I don't. There's so many items that I don't really know what to do. And okay. Some guides, I refreshers, shivas, things like that, but I don't. Okay, gotcha, like, gotcha, 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 gotcha. So we're gonna ignore the items in the game. How how often do you play with your friends? Um, every other day. But let's say. Like, what percentage of your Dota days. games are with your friends? Uh. About 40, maybe half. Okay, okay. That's uh, that's what I wanted to know. So, your friends have played a lot of Dota, right? Like, they're, they're, they've played a lot? Yeah, they've played for a lot. You, you, you said you were trying to catch up to them. That's what it was in the first session? Yeah. Okay. I just didn't, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to be clear. Your friends are going to have to help me out a little bit here, okay, to make sure you get the most out of this situation. But so, here's how I'm going to shift your focus. Let's ignore everything that we know about items in dota okay like let's ignore specific items you know you bought a bracer here you're buying phase boots you bought a vlad like you you could buy a vlad you could buy a desk you could buy a blink you could buy a mech you could buy like there's all types of items in dota there's you know there's a lot of fucking items we're gonna ignore the individual items and we're gonna purely look at what's happening to you okay that's all we're gonna notice okay. i'm gonna tell you to look at your hero and tell me what's happening to you so you're playing the lane Let's just play it out. You're farming. You're chilling. Nothing's really like nothing's really happening to you right now, right? Like you're just you're just farming. Nothing going wrong. You're cutting the creeps. So because you're cutting the creeps, what are you doing? I'm using mana. Using okay. Mine. And what else is happening? 
And my creeps is crashing into his tower. Okay, great. So you you are cutting behind tower, and in order to do this, you are getting clicked by a lot of creeps. Like a lot of these creeps are hitting you, and you are spamming your anchor smash. So what does that mean? Like what what is what is happening to you? I, um, I'm losing health and I'm losing mana. So okay, region. yes. So what you need to understand in this given moment is from experience that you played behind their tower. So your friend told you to play behind the tower. So you've now learned that this is like an aggressive move, okay? So what I'm going to tell you is, is that every move in the game, whether whatever hero you are, requires different things. So heroes that cut behind tower, the axes and the centaurs, and I guess tide is okay at it, timber saws, what do they all have in common, do you know? What timber saw, axe, centaur, do you know what all those three heroes have in common? Or do you not know? It's fine if you don't. Mana issues, I suppose? No. All of them have sustain. Timbersaw's reactive armor gives him the sustain. Centaur and Axe buy sustain. That's what those heroes do. Like, what does Axe go? Don't you go, like, Vanguard first item or, like, Hood five? Fi- Isn't that what you do? Or no? Yep. Yep. Right? And that's, that is a common characteristic of all of the heroes that cut creeps. Is that because you're cutting creeps, you're either spending health and or mana... To do so like you have to like that's that it, it's going to happen every single time you cut creeps so on axe you're not really spending mana because you're just using spin but you're going to be taking damage because you're getting hit by creeps so you just purely go health regen items right like you just you go the ring of health you go the vanguard you go hood whatever you go items that give you health timber saw on the other hand has health handed to him right like he his a passive gives him health so what that means is he needs to be able to cast spells, which usually Timber Saw's first items are Soul Ring and Mana Boots. So it's sustain items because he already has the health and he just wants mana to be able to cast spells. Same thing with Centaur. I don't know if you've played Centaur, but he just he's the, he's similar to Axe. He's very similar to Axe. His, he doesn't use too much mana in the early game, and he's mainly concerned about the fact that he's getting hit by a bunch of stuff. Tide, on the other hand, you are getting hit and you're also casting spells. And do any of your abilities give you health or mana? No. No. So on Tide, you need to buy both. If you're doing this, like if you're playing like this, you need to give yourself health and mana. So options for health and mana. First and foremost, let's actually ignore this. You need to give yourself health and mana. So I need you to know that I don't need you to come up with the right item. I need you to buy an item that gives you health and or mana. Like if you can, if we can get you there... That's a great progress to do this. It's, it's so I, this really stems from watching the game with me, like you are now, and then turning it into watching your own games and seeing like, what's happening to you? Are you losing health and mana? Are you dying full to zero? So it's like, if you're dying, then you'd ask yourself how you're dying. You know, did I just get chased from one end of the lane to the other? Did I just get bursted? Did I just like full to zero, like right away? You know, how did you die? So it's like, if you got chased down the lane, what item would you buy? Like, if they just chased you from one end of the lane to the other and killed you, what item would you buy? Move speed, maybe? Yeah, move speed, right? Because you were running away and you couldn't escape, right? If you died full to zero, where they just, like, used three spells on you and killed you, what items would you consider buying there? A hood or something to make me... Items that make you tankier, right? So the point is, I'm... Okay, I want to be very clear to you, by the way. I'm specifically telling you to not give me answers of specific items. I'm telling you to give me a description of what the items need to give you. Okay? Because that's it's going to be really important to you because you're coming from a lot of MOBA experience, but you don't know specific things about Dota yet. Okay? So what you're going to realize is if you're like, damn, I needed move speed there. Damn, I needed to be tankier there. Damn, I needed health sustain or mana sustain. If you can get that part down first, that is incredible. Like, that's the that's the first step. And the next step is to learning exactly which items do what on which heroes. You know, every item, every hero is a bit different. But, like, Soul Ring is an item that gives you mana, but it takes away health. So, if you're going to have health issues, Soul Ring is not a good item. But that's why it's good on, like, Timbersaw. Um, Tide can buy Soul Ring. Oftentimes, tides that buy Sol Ring also go, you know, Hood or Vlad's because that gives them the health sustain that they needed to compensate for the Sol Ring. 
The point is that if you first come to the conclusion after we watch this lane play out that you needed to buy health and mana, because, like, let's just watch. Like, we're just watching the lane. You're doing normal things. You killed their support. Nothing crazy going on here. You keep cutting creeps. You're going to drag them into the small camp, get a few extra creeps off of it. And after all this stuff, because we're not critiquing how you played the lane, I'm telling you the things you're doing in lane are at least reasonable. They are above the 2k level. This is what it looks like after you've played the lane. Like, this is now what it looks like. So, you need to be able to look at this and go, hmm, I needed health and mana. And it's like, in the, in the future, the goal would be that you would recognize every time you cut behind tower, you run out of health and mana, okay? And so, rather than realizing it now, you would know as you go to start doing it. You know what I mean? Like, you're like, oh, I'm going to go cut behind tower. That means I'll need health and mana. So, in and this... By, by, by it preemptively. So, like, when this happens, my courier is already arriving. Exactly, right? So, like, the first yeah. step is that you would realize it after it's already happened. We all have to go through this, okay? We all have to go through the realizing it happens to us and then learning the foresight portion, okay? So, this is naturally... This is why I'm telling you don't be too hard on yourself that you don't know that was going to happen necessarily. But now that we see it happening, I'm just going to tell you any way you play the lane... It's going to become pretty repetitive in the sense that if you play aggressively to kill them, you'll probably want move speed and damage. Like, if you're in a kill lane, you're probably killing them with damage and move speed, right? On Tide, you're gushing them and running at them. So, Phase Boots Bracer would make sense. Like, you know, you're going to buy Phase Boots Bracer to move faster and do more damage. But in this lane, you're playing behind their tower, cutting and getting more farm, which in that case, you're spending health and mana. So if you were to buy Soul Ring here and then have all the mana in the world and no health, then what you'll realize is on a hero that buys Soul Ring, it may not be good to buy Soul Ring in that specific game. You know, if you bought, bought like, I'm just going to tell you the options now. The options for, for mana and health for you in lane are Soul Ring plus a health sustain item. So like Soul Ring plus Ring of Health or Soul Ring plus a Morbid Mask. Okay, that's, that's you know, that kind of stuff. For t we're talking about Tide, okay? So, it's like, Soul Ring plus a um, health sustain item. Bottle. Mana boots into, like, mech. Okay, like, mana boots with the headdress. And just straight Vlads, I would say. Where you go, like, Basilius and uh, the Morbid Mask. Those are pretty much the options. So, usually in this patch, what people do in a situation like this is they, get, they, they buy a bottle. That's usually what they do. Because it's the cheapest version of all of those. You know, Soul Ring plus Morbid or Soul Ring plus Ring of Health, that's like 1,600 gold. You know, uh, Bottles, 6, 675. So, like, what you'll realize is, is that if you're going to play the lane like this on Tide, Bottle would work really nicely. Um, but if you're playing to kill him, Bottle's not a good item because it doesn't help you kill the guy at all. You know, <laughs> it just helps you sustain. So... That's the focus I want to give you, is that if you can move forward from this and look at your health and mana here and not buy phase boots, that's, like, great. <laughs> like, if you bought any item that gave you health and mana, we can move on from here, right? Like, we can say, like, if you tried Ring of Health plus Bassy or Morbid plus Bassy and it didn't work out or something, we can talk about it. Um, are you with me? Does this help so far or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So... Let's go ahead and play this out. This is a situation where if you don't, like, it doesn't matter if you have really high power level if you're just sitting with no health and mana, right? Like, you, you might as well have no net worth if you have no health and mana. That's kind of how I look at it. Um, so you did buy yourself some clarity. So you, you did, like, clearly recognize, you know, having some mana issues. Yeah. So what happens here is that you were being really aggressive. You got, like, a lot of farm. And then you basically forced to do nothing for, like two minutes so then void gets uh or like three or four minutes actually and then void gets level six before you because of that and then you like lost the lane because of it technically you still have 40 cs though so it's like you're csing well but you're not getting as much out of the lane as you as you could so i'm just trying to provide an explanation to you about like what happened here the goal in the lane is to understand each individual stage of the lane and if you can learn this on like a couple heroes then you'll get better at the process. It's, it's a similar process on every hero. It's like every hero has a certain way they like to play for like each individual level. Um, and as long as you, and the closer you can become with being like in tune with that, 
is the better. So, like, certain heroes have different options. You know, Tide, he can be the kill hero, but he can also be the guy that cuts behind tower. It's like with Axe, usually you pretty much are always cutting behind tower around, like, level 4 or 5. Um, like, almost always. So, by then, you always have to have a sustain item. Otherwise, it just doesn't really work. Uh, but beforehand, you can't, you know, you, you can't just rush a ring of health, usually. Because you have to lane for the first, like, three levels. But that's... Be All I'm trying to say is there's common trends with the way you're going to play a hero. So, like, in this game, we got this. Do you have another Tide game? Or no? Um, I have one that I went a different build, but... The laning stage didn't go that well because we played with another friend that was um, about Herald, I think it's called. Okay, it's really low. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah. Um, let's check that so, out real quick. I just want to make sure I iron this out, um, and then we'll um, we'll watch like the later portions of like the 10 to 25 minute mark um, to wrap it up. Just I, I just want to make sure I iron this out a little bit with two examples for you, more than just one. So let's see how you play this lane. Um... Yeah, you got some Herald people in this game. <laughs> that is that is indeed or no Guardian, Guardian, Guardian. Step up from Herald. In this lane, I just since I was laning with him, and I let's just say I played a couple of games with him before. I was just I, I just knew what to expect and didn't really want to do anything aggressive. You had no expectations. No offense to this. Yeah, I, that's why I level gush too. I could try to see us from. A hey, hey, that it. that's a great adjustment, man. Honestly, that's a great adjustment. Uh, it's kind of funny, but that is a good adjustment. So, yeah, poor Morana. Even arrowed your range creep, and uh, you weren't in XP range. Yeah, you're definitely not defensively aggroing enough. You know, you are, but you need to do it even more. In a lane like this, like if you're gonna play this passively, you need to at least draw the creeps towards you. Uh, like, if you're not getting any creeps in a bad lane, and you're just full HP, that's just, like, not okay. Just to be clear. Like, you need to be willing to tank some damage to, like, drag the creeps towards you and stuff. Um, it's better to, like, tank some damage and get the creeps than it is to just, like, sit back getting no creeps. This is kind of, like, the aggressive version of being defensive. Like, what I mean by that is, like, when you think you're winning the lane, you're gonna sit behind their tower cutting. It's like, when you think you're losing the lane, you should be trying to drag creeps as much as possible. Because, but usually when you're losing the lane, you'll still take damage when you're doing that and stuff, so. Um, okay, so you're actually gonna be a little bit aggressive. Okay. This is very, this is a very fascinating scenario I'm watching here. This is fascinating. I'll actually just tell you the cheat code to offlane right now. If this is what your health and mana situation looks like, you should have bought a bottle in that game. Like, I'll, I'll just give you, like, the absolute concrete answer here. Bottle is the solution this patch. It may be different in the future, but you buy a bottle. And then you go pick up the six-minute bounty. Um, When your support dies... Do you know how, like, bottle refill works or no? Yeah, this patch is uh, bounties refill just two charges, right? No, I'm saying that when somebody TPs in from base and fills your bottle. Do you know how that works? I've seen it, but I've never really seen it, like, in my games at all. Okay, so, I mean, you play with yeah. your friends. So, you, you and your friends need to work on this. So, it's fine if it's not in your games, which is understandable, but um, it's it's a mechanic in Dota that there's no reason for you to not utilize it, so... The way it works is that the fountain buff lingers. So if your bottle gets transferred into their inventory within like two or three seconds of them TPing in, it'll consider them in the fountain. So it fills your bottle up. Okay. Uh, so you guys need to get a habit of doing that. And so what the bottle does is in this case, you'd have three charges. Your Marana died, I think, right? Your Marana died. Yeah. Your Marana yeah. dies. And when she TPs back in, she fills your bottle, and it's like you now would have had full health, full mana because you used three bottle charges, and then you also have three more bottle charges <laughs> uh, because she TP'd in and filled your bottle. So, like, just imagine this exact same lane the way you're playing it, where instead of, like, this stick plus boots, you just have a bottle, right? Like, just imagine it, right? And it's, it's a situation where it's either when you're playing very defensively 
or when you're playing very farm oriented, all that matters is sustaining as an offlaner. Okay. It's really all there is to it. If you're playing incredibly defensive or farm oriented, it's all sustain. If you're looking to fight them or you're looking to evade death, um, where you're dying full to zero, then you buy these movement speed and damage items. Okay. It's like, it doesn't matter if you move faster to run away from them if you're at half HP. You would rather be full HP with no boots than half HP with boots. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So it's like, you may say, like, I'm in a bad lane, so I bought some boots so that I wouldn't die. But it's like, you have boots with 488 HP rather than no boots with 1,000. So you'd just rather have that. Uh, so that's just a big lesson for the offlane. So what I'm seeing here, I kind of expected it a bit, but you're just having some serious sustain issues in your lanes. And you just can't play Dota. So, like, it doesn't matter how mechanically skilled you are or anything. You just, you cannot play Dota if you're sitting at half health. Like, you died there because you're half HP. Maybe it was ill-advised that you walk up there, but you died because you were half health. If you are dying from full to zero and you bought a bottle, that probably tells you you shouldn't have bought a bottle. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, because I'm being bursted down. Yeah, so it's like, what does a bottle do if I just have full health and die anyway? Uh, that's 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 like the, um, the like the litmus test for when you're not supposed to buy a bottle. Like, so for the future, if you're like, man, BSJ told me bottles are a really good item in these tough lanes. It's like you weren't supposed to buy a bottle if you're just dying anyway. In those type of lanes, you usually go tranquils. By the way, tranquils are tranquils plus clarities is like the cheapest way to sustain yourself and also not die. Does that make sense? Because it gives you a little bit of movement yeah. speed and it also sustains you. So I'll just tell you, it's like, you don't want to go tranquils, but that's like, if you need sustain and bottle's not going to keep you alive, you go tranquil boots. Okay. Um, it happened yeah. to me on Centaur today. People asked me why I built it. And I'm like, you know, I'm now giving an in-depth explanation of why I built it. But okay. So we've talked enough about lanes. Seems like a similar issue in both lanes. I think the name of the game for you is sustain, but I think the biggest thing is like really paying attention to what you're doing in lane. Um, are people running towards you, away from you, so you need move speed? Are you trading a lot, so you just need some damage and uh, and uh, armor? Are, are you know are, what what's going on? So in these games, it's definitely both uh, sustain. So we're gonna fast forward a bit to see what you do later in the game um, as we move forward. I ended up going just the uh, Greaves and Pipe build because I just suppose like since I'm not doing anything I might just buy some like some resources for my team or something. Yeah, usually as offlane you either make yourself really strong so that you draw attention away from your team or you make them strong by buying items for them. So I usually come to that conclusion if I don't think I can be strong, if that makes sense. So basically what you just said is correct. You know, you think you're pretty useless if you try to make yourself strong, so you made you you know, you bought some items for them. That's that's pretty pretty standard uh, offlane mentality, I'd say. Okay, you're So we're now going to have to differentiate between axe and tide, okay? Axe like Nothing I say to you is absolute, okay? But Axe pretty much stays in his lane until he buys a blink, okay? Sometimes you may be able to, like, walk mid or something, but pretty much TPing to, like, your own safe lane or something on on Axe is, like, you're, you're ruining your own game. So you're pretty much, like, playing for either farming triangle if you are lost your lane or farming behind their tower if you're strong. You know, that's pretty much what Axe does. So let's, like, specifically talk about Tide. And this refers to, like, every offlaner that has an ultimate. So if you have an ultimate, the only thing that's wrong is to just sit here holding your dick, okay? You need to be contesting somebody, okay? You either need to be shoving this lane into their tower and then looking to make something happen, or you need to be, like, threatening the guy in your lane consistently with your ultimate, so because you kind of were forced to play passively in your lane, meaning like you can't threaten the gyro, you need to get out of here. Okay, so there's two choices. I'm going to be very clear at this stage in the game. When you have an ultimate like this, your ultimate either threatens the guy in front of you, in which case you continue playing your lane. Okay, or you don't threaten that guy and you need to go use it somewhere else. 
Because if you don't threaten the guy with your ultimate, you're probably not farming very much. Does that make sense? Because like he's probably like shoving you out of lane and stuff. Yeah, he's probably stronger and I'm yeah. be playing just like this, yeah. So you have an ultimate and then you're like sitting in a lane and farming inefficiently. Like so in that second case where like you don't kill him with your ult, you're now like a hero that has potentially strong impact and you're just doing nothing. But like if you threaten him with your ult and you're farming a lot, even if you don't use your ultimate, you're doing a lot. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm keeping him from farming. Like, I'm saying that if you're farming really fast, and you're potentially slowing down his farm with your ultimate being a threat, then that's a usefulness of your ult. Like, having your ultimate be scary to him, such that you can farm more and he farms less, that's great. Like, people meme about it, but the threat of the Ravage can sometimes be better than the actual Ravage. Does that kind of make sense or no? Yeah. yeah so yeah. yeah, like, if you're able to completely control this area, and you're an offlaner with an ult, then play this area. You know, if you're a Doom, if you're a Tide, where, like, anybody who walks into your lane would die to your Ravage, then you should stay in your lane and control the fuck out of that area. You know, like, people ask if I'm winning as off lane, do I rotate or do I stay in my lane? It's like, well, you know, it's different every single game, but I would ideally like to stay in my own lane because that's where I get to farm, you know? But if you're losing, then you either are like an axe where if you were to go to other lanes as axe and you lost your lane, what are you going to do? Nothing because you like, just run yeah, up and you, you can't jump on them. Yeah, yeah. You, you literally don't do anything. So it's like if you're losing yeah. as axe, you don't go gank, you know, usually. So, but on tide, if you're losing your lane, you should go do something because your hero has an ability, despite how bad your game is, that will be useful somewhere. It will be useful somewhere. So for you to come to this conclusion that you're not really farming your lane, like it's not going that great, and you have an ultimate, you should just go somewhere. I really don't care where it is. You know, you're going to have to learn exactly what like factors go into what. But I'll tell you this. You can either walk because nothing's really happening in the game, meaning you just like look at all the lanes and nothing specifically is happening at that moment. Or if you see your team in a fight, you should just immediately TP. But this comes all with the awareness that you have an ultimate and you're not exactly, like, free farming down here. Do you know what I mean? Like, com combine those two things, that means you're just looking for somewhere to go. So that usually means that you don't want to spend time here. Any time you spend just casually hitting creeps is bad. It's just bad. Like, at this stage. Anytime you're just hitting some creeps, it's just bad. So that means we quickly clear this lane and get out and go somewhere. So if you want to push into the tower and you're like, oh, Gyro came back, I guess I'll clear this wave. Like, you could have gone to that fight very well if you wanted to. But the one thing I don't want to see is this. You're just waiting for the creeps to die. You know, you're like hitting one at a time. You're denying your own creep. You're like staticking the creep wave. This is what you would do. Staticking meaning you're not pushing it. You're not doing anything with it. This is what you do when you are tied that lost his lane and you've already used Ravage. Because, like, you're just useless. So, like, why not static the wave? You're literally fucking useless. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, it would be, yeah, it would be better, since I've lost my lane, it would be better to generate a lead somewhere else and then just come back and just defensively farm again. Yeah, exactly. What you're doing here is as if you've already made a move. So, the, in, the concept that I'm introducing to you is, like, this on-off switch concept. And it's usually heroes that have power spikes. Okay? It's just heroes that have, like, a big timing. Whether or not it's like a BKB timing, whether or not it's an ultimate based timing. And it's just like, go use it. Go do something with it. And I'm going to be clear that all it means to do something with it is that you get to play differently than you would if you didn't have it. Like, so say your Ravage is on cooldown, you don't have it. Would you play like this? Yes. So if it's on, like, the best way to know that you're not doing the right thing is that. This is what you'd be doing if Ravage was on cooldown. <laughs> like, that's this is what exactly you would be doing. So, it's like, if I have a BKB and I'm still farming Triangle, wasn't I farming Triangle before I got my BKB? So, why did I buy a BKB just to keep farming the Triangle? That, like, makes no sense, right? Like, when you get power spikes, you're supposed to change something about what you're doing in the game. So, it's like, whether or not that lets you play super aggressive in your own lane and run at the guy and shove him out of lane and get your own farm or that means that you get to go somewhere and help your team whatever it means either one's an option in whatever game you're in it's 
It's like maybe before you had your ultimate, you weren't able to kill the gyro. Say you were winning your lane, but you weren't able to kill him yet. But now that you got your ultimate, you're able to kill him. So suddenly, instead of like playing to win the lane, you're now playing to kill the guy. You know, like you've already won the lane, you're not going to kill him. Are you following me or have I lost you at all? I don't know how fast I'm talking here. Sometimes I get carried away. Oh, yeah, I get it. It's like with Tide, I, since I have in my ulti, I can now threaten to actually do something to him instead okay. of just like playing like this. Yeah. Okay, it's cool. Oh. Um, and it, I don't really, the emphasis I'm giving you about these items is that if you recognize you need sustain and you buy any item in the game that attempts to give you sustain, that's a great first step. I, I don't, I can't tell you exactly where you're supposed to go here. There's like so many different moving factors that decide where you go here. But if you can come to the recognition that you're supposed to go somewhere here, that's like really good. So usually I would just try to understand basics about objectives. Do you know my order of objectives? Like, do you, have, uh, you, have you seen oh, this video? I, I don't think so. I remember in a video you specifically mentioned that if I can, I can try to get the bottom, like the offline tower, which is their safe lane, and then run towards mid. I remember that. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you the quick, like, uh, rundown as to save you, uh, to be as quick as possible. This is... This is like the 70 to 80% of game situation, okay? This is like the standard that you should assume is going to happen, but there's always things that can make a difference. This t for we're, we're going to play from the dire side and reverse it if you're radiant, okay? Like, just, you know, if it's bottom lane on dire, it's top lane on radiant, okay? Like, that's what I mean. So, we're dire. Order of objectives is going to be taking this tower, like you said, this first, this tower right here, and then the next tower you take is either this one or this one. Okay, that's one of the two. Um, so whenever you have an ultimate, you it will or like you have a power spike and you want to do something, it's almost always as an off laner geared towards an objective. Okay, like so right now, because I understand objectives, your objective would normally be bottom, but you lost your lane really hard. So I want to tell you, let's let's I can't give the TLDR. I'm actually just gonna do my best. If it's either going to be mid or bottom, I'll just tell you that right now. It's one of these two towers. And if you're radiant, it's going to be mid or top. Most of the time, it's going to be this tower. But if you lost your lane, it's probably not going to be this tower. Okay? <laughs> like, that's like if you lost your lane pretty bad, that's not going to be this tower. So, my point being is, though, when you are thinking to use your Ravage, you're either pressuring this tower or you're pressuring this tower. Okay? It's one of the two. If you are not pressuring a tower, there's only one other option. I know I just said it's one of those two, but there's only one other option. And that means the other team is pressuring towers. So that means you're either... Okay, just follow me. I'm going to sum this up. You're either pressuring this tower or this tower, or you are defending this tower or this tower up here. So right now, just to give you like how high-level Dota player would understand this, you're not capable of pressuring this tower. This tower is already dead. So your play has to be here. Because it's either defending this one or pushing this one. Do you see that? How you followed me there? Yeah. Okay. My point being is that if you were to be aware that you were supposed to do something. And then know that it's either here or here. That's as much as I could possibly ask of you right now. And in the future, once you've played, you know another 30 or 40 games, you'll have your own better insight of which one might have worked out better, you know? Are you are you with me there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Uh, right now, the definite play should have been to just walk mid or TP mid, either way, uh, just because that was the one to do. Uh, but looks like they kind of left you alone here, and you're going to go towards your team. So I would say you going towards your team there is great. Took you an extra two or three minutes than it should. Pretty much decides MMR most of the time. Is like how fast you hit your timings and how quickly you capitalize on on advantages. Um, so I will give you a t uh, like a general rule that if you have an ultimate and if there are heroes there, you're forced to run away. You're probably not doing the right thing. 
It's nice that they went on you and your teammate came and you guys turned that around, so that worked out pretty decently. But even then, I don't think that was necessarily the right play. But I do like that you were being aggressive. I do like that you were, like, playing up at the tower, trying to threaten it. I, I think that was good. I think uh, your idea of, like, okay, I'm going to run at this tower, even though it um, wasn't necessarily clean, I think that's a good start. Like, I think that's fine. You should have started this whole process, like, two minutes earlier. And everything you did there was fine. Uh, okay. You're not going to walk at some people. Items seem reasonable. Um, how many of these people are in your party? Um, three, but just one was in voice chat. The Mirana doesn't like to, like to be in voice Who, chat Who's the all. guy in your team? Is it the Void or the... The Void. Yeah, yeah, the Void. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm the one that told him that let's just, um, since we killed the tower, let's try to farm this and then leave. And I learned pretty fast that we couldn't do that. Okay. You know what? If your idea was let's farm this and leave, and then you realize from this example that you just can't do that, I have nothing further to teach you. Like, this was about the most aggressive play you could make in the game, and I was going to tell you that as long as you're aware that this is really aggressive, then that's fine. <laughs> like, this is a very aggressive play. So, my question... Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I didn't think... I didn't know if they had any wars, if it was just they were just walking in or anything, but... I just really thought that if we could push the, a bit more of the advantage and take away like some other camps, it would be better. Okay, so when do you think that might have worked? Um, like, what's the issue here? I felt like we didn't have any vision and we were missing like one other hero, maybe. Yeah, so it's, it's a combination of lack of vision and a combination that three of your heroes are bottom. So I will just tell you that this is an aggressive play and the way you get better at Dota in this stage of the game, because now it's not like the lane where you're only worried about like one or two heroes. You now have to say like, oh, maybe we could have done this with more resources. It's like if you brought all five heroes here and tried this and it didn't work, it was probably just a really bad play. Okay. But it's important if you can gauge the why it didn't work such that you don't become a wimp in the future. Okay. Okay. Because, like, there are people who they'll do this and they'll just never try to invade Triangle again. Okay? Because they're just, like, scared of dying again. But it's like, if your Invoker and or Marana and or CM were there, this might have gone differently. Right? So, yeah. that's just how it is. Um, okay. You do end up TPing out. What's your reasoning here? Like, what's going through your head? I wanted to farm, but then I saw someone else there, and I just decided just to leave it there. Then I wanted to push mid in, and then I got caught with the CM. Okay. <clears throat> oh, I just got to follow your reasoning. We have about 10 minutes left here, so I want to make sure I hash out your mid-game movements just a bit. What does League do? In terms of uh, how often like people team fight and stuff. Um, well, there we had um, two objectives. Let's say Roshan would be called the Baron, which would be, which would give you a buff that, um, I give you like a two minute buff that would um, buff up the minions. So your goal would be if you wanted to push, you get the Baron, you buff up your minions, and then you take towers. So I'm just and, asking, like, uh, so I actually understand generally what the objectives in League are, but my question would be, how often are you fighting the opponent for those objectives? Um, depends on uh, how strong you really feel like you are. If you're strong, you'd be taking, let's say, dragons each each time they spawn, so then you can accumulate four, and then that would be your win condition. Okay. Um, if not, you I just I used to play. A lot of support and top lane and the top is like kind of like off of that in the sense that um once i had a couple items i would usually just play with my carry and just if he wanted to go in i would go in and then he would fall okay so when you're playing support in league how often are you like following your cores around like always like okay. pretty much always yeah, yeah. okay so my question would be if you have a support farming bottom why aren't you willing to go bottom how is that any different than league where like a support and a core farm the same area or like stay in the same area together 
I felt like in Dota, like everyone pretty much farms a bit. Um, in League, you wouldn't touch a, a minion if you were support. You wouldn't even try to farm. My question it. would be, um, like, why did you want to farm bottom? I guess it would be a better answer or better question here. Um, it Was it seemed just like for the... the sake of farm or what? No, it seemed like it was the easier tower to try to pressure since it's the only outer left. So I'm just suppose it would be kind of easy to take. Why did you want to pressure a tower? Because my whole team, well, I mean, my team was farming. Void was top, and so if I go bottom, maybe they go bottom, and then he pushes out a bit more, and, and that'll help him. Okay. So all the reasons you just gave me, that's what actually fucking matters, not who's farming the lane. That could be your carry Void farming that lane, and if you think it's correct to push that tower, then you walk to the damn tower. Do you see what I'm saying here? Like, you're overthinking the fact that people in Dota farm, dude. You just told me why you wanted to farm bottom. You said you wanted to push the tower. You think it's the most easily pressurable tower. You think that's, like, where you're supposed to go. And then you just didn't because there's a Marana there. That literally makes no sense. Like, if you think about it. Like, it, it just makes no sense. You just told me you had, like, a whole idea of, like, why you were supposed to go there, the objective you could pressure, and, like, what you could do with it. And then you're like, ah, I have a four position there. I guess not. Like, if he's not there, are you not... Are you gonna are you gonna pressure the tower if you have no teammates there? Like, don't you want teammates there? You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like it should work the other way. Like, if you have a four position there, you'd be more happy to go there because there's more heroes to hit the tower. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I just didn't, I just thought I just wanted it in my mind. I think I, I since I saw her, I just like leave her to the lane, let her farm. I can farm. Um, mid and then maybe go back bottom after she gets a wave or something. Here's just, here's like, to be clear. You're an offlaner. So as a carry, we usually have to prioritize our own games, okay? We have to prioritize, like, however much farm we can get on the map and then mix that in with, like, objectives in the game and stuff. As an offlaner, you put yourself near relevant stuff. You put yourself near objectives you're trying to take or objectives the opponent's trying to take. That's where you put yourself. You don't give a shit about farm. Meaning, like... If there's farm near those objectives, you get the farm, okay? Like, that's how offlane works. So all I'm telling you is, ignore all this crap you're telling yourself about, like, who's farming where and shit, and just recognize what objectives you think matter in the game. So if you're telling me bottom tower is what matters to you, then you go there. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, go all, all this, like, farm distribution shit doesn't matter. The only time that you think what you just said about Marana, where she's farming and you could go farm jungle... When do you think that would be the answer? Actually, I'll ask you. When do you think that's the correct way to think? Maybe if Murana was, um, I don't know, maybe position one Murana? I don't know. Maybe, when maybe I'm telling to... you that you're supposed to think the way you're thinking, what is your primary focus? That's a hard question to answer. Uh, what is guiding my your decision here that I told you to use? What is guiding your decision? My decision... Um, to try to alleviate pressure for the void. But how, to what, what, an to get an objective. What was yeah. driving your decision? It was an objective. So when do you play to just farm? When there's no objective. When there's no objective. It is, it's Dota, dude. <laughs> like, a lot of Dota is realizing what isn't true. And then, or isn't the case. And then you can work with that. It's actually a lot of the information you gather in Dota. It's like, there's no objective to play for? Okay, let's be efficient. But my question is, if you don't have an objective to play for, what's the first question you should ask yourself? Um, where can I be the most efficient? That's true. That's like the second question. You skipped over one. There's no objective. Try to f force people to be in certain places. What's the opponent's like, objective? Not to destroy... Like, to... Uh, to get my ancient that's the basic no, objective, I'm, right? I'm saying like your i mean of course but i'm saying like your objective right now is bottom tower but i'm saying if you don't have an objective that's clear to you right now meaning the next objective for you you have to ask yourself what the opponent's objective is so if you were to ask okay. yourself right now what would be a logical objective for the opponent to go for maybe a roshan or maybe okay a... stop yourself 
You gave yourself that. That is a that is a reasonable answer. Okay, I'm telling you really very clearly. Hopefully, it it works for you. Is that in lane and in game, you have a pretty decent sense of what objectives matter. Okay, so you can just say Roshan. Like, it, like yeah, sure. It's okay if you have a little bit of hesitation. I know it can be. I can be um, very uh, very uh, overwhelming or something. Or I don't know. I, I'm struggling for words, but. My point is that here's how you think as an offlaner. This is where we're going to wrap up the session, but it's going to go a long way for you, and I know it will. Your first guidance is whether or not you think you can take an objective, okay? If there's an objective that you think is something you can do towards, whether that's a tower, a roche, a team fight, okay? And you go there. I don't care who's farming. Don't grief yourself. If you think you can take an objective or be useful on the map, whoever the fuck's there, go join them. Okay? Like, if your Void's bottom, go join him. If your Invoker's bottom, go join him. If it's your Marana, go join her. Because you said to me that bottom tower is a relevant objective to you. If you don't have an objective that you can think of, meaning, like, say bottom tier 1 was dead right now, and um, the next objective would be, like, bottom tier 2, but you're not getting it anytime soon, you, like, you don't think you're getting it anytime soon, then... The next question is, does the opponent have an objective? Okay? If the opponent has an objective, say Roshan, you should farm near Rosh. Because you are being useful as an offlaner. Because you are farming near where the opponent might go, and you're trying to prevent them from getting Rosh. Do you see that? How that's like a usefulness of an offlaner? As a carry, yeah. I usually farm away from their objective because I'm not trying to fight them. And you're making space for me. Do you see how that works, right? Yeah, I have to be where there's going to be a team fight or maybe just tell my supports to help me get the objective. and Exactly. So all I'm telling mm -hmm. you is when it comes to your movements here, you've had a lot of right answers, way more than a 2K player should have. And you're just like overthinking it in Dota. Like I want you to be purely based off of objectives and don't like ignore whoever on your team's already there. Like ignore that. Just tell yourself like where do you think the objectives are, you know? It's like, you're going to go bottom here. You can't come up with an objective. What's the opponent's objective? You told me Roche, you're going to go stand next to Roche. If you say, what if Roche is dead right now? Like, what if you can't take bottom tower and Roche is dead? What was the question uh, you said you were going to ask yourself? Where can I be more efficient? Damn, right there, dude. That's it. Honestly, that covers like 95% of, of decisions in Dota. It's hard to like get the right answer to that, but that really does cover it. As an offlaner, if you can get yourself to be trained to think like that, it's, like, really good. And you actually have pretty good knowledge of, like, where you're supposed to be. Uh, like, where you'd want to be. Like, you told me their objective would be Rosh. You told me your objective was bottom. So first ask yourself what your objective is. Can't come up with one? Ask yourself what their objective is. You can't come up with one? Play for efficiency. It's just that simple. But if you're a Tide and you think there's a relevant objective and you have Ravage coming off cooldown in 20 seconds and you jungle... Man, are you being useless? Yeah, I'm not in position to, to, for the fight. You're just not doing anything. And so mm -hmm. you're just walking back and forth. So I think you're not trusting your gut enough uh, on this kind of stuff. So um, I'll just tell you, uh, I'll, I'll reiterate, you know, coming from somebody who's played a shit ton of Dota, your laning mechanics and your game understanding is above your MMR. You're just, you're you're getting distracted with things that don't matter or you're thinking about the things the wrong way so when it came to items i just want you to be more about like what i what my item needs to do rather than what the specific item is okay when it comes to like map movements just all about what's my objective what's their objective if not that where can i be efficient okay so that applies at like the eight minute mark you know if you're an axe and you know you're useless in team fights and you can't pressure bottom guess what you're jungling <laughs> The, the decision yeah, until I can get my, my blink or can yeah, get an item or something. Exactly. Like the decision's the same. Usually when you play the efficiency game, the only question you have to ask yourself is, when does this change? You know? It's like, when do I stop doing this? You know, with Axe, it's when you get your blink dagger. It's like, with Tide, maybe it's when you get Ravage. You know? But that's the question that ends that. You know, once you start playing for efficiency, when do I stop? That's, that's like the... That's the... And then once you once you stop, that's like resets the entire question again, right? <laughs> it's like, okay, I, I realized I was supposed to play for efficiency. 
I need my blink dagger. It's like, okay, now that I have my blink dagger, what's our objective? Oh, we don't have one? What's their objective? You know? <laughs> it just resets it. Resets the thought process over and over again. Does that make sense? Yeah. If we don't have an objective, try to... Like, if they try to take Roshan, I could set up and then try to get a good Ravage in and then win a fight. Absolutely. What pains me the yeah. most here is that you know exactly what objective you're supposed to go towards because I would tell you right now to walk bottom. I would literally tell you to walk bottom right now. And you didn't because you have a Marana there. Like, man, what like an irrelevant reason to not do what you're supposed to do when you already know what you're supposed to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, it's just it's just the priorities thing. I want to make sure your priorities are in line with. Uh, with... Yeah, I suppose I gave him I gave him too much credit or try to like I don't know. You're trying to be too generic. nice of a teammate or whatever. It, the thing is, it's like it's not specific to what role that guy is. It's like that could be your carry, it could be your off laner or your mid laner, it could be your supports. You're supposed to go to the objective because you're an off laner. Like that's what you're supposed to do. So, um, yeah, that's it. Do you have any like final questions or like to wrap up my lesson for you? Maybe do you have another hero <laughs> that you'd recommend? Because I feel like with Axe and Tide, if you get jumped on, it's just, like, really bad. It just feels bad. <laughs> yeah, so you're thinking about a hero that plays lanes a bit more, maybe. Um, yeah, like, a bit more relevant, because I feel like sometimes I get these good lane matchups, but then I can't pressure someone enough. That may be just me, or just, like, me not being confident enough, but... Um, I'm thinking, you know, for the current patch... Uh... I think Centaur is too much like Axe. I don't think it'll like help your hero pool at all to do Centaur. Uh... I've tried Centaur, and I've been having one game I played. I've I just realized I had to buy like two salves just to like keep myself in and try to keep pressuring. So yeah, it's, I've, I've played you know it, honestly yeah. at your bracket, I'd be curious to see it. I think you should try Venomancer. Venomancer. I actually think you you based on the way you see the game, you're a very objective based player the thing about venomancer i'm gonna get uh, why i want you to play him actually and w w so the difference between him and axe and tide is that you don't have a stun so I i'm like you're picking an off laner that's more about playing the map properly than it is about stunning people okay the thing about venomancer is that he's a hero that if he gets to like level five without dying he just like boots anyone out of lane it doesn't matter it doesn't matter who it is they get booted out of lane so the whole idea of the hero is to survive like the first three or four levels and then you take over that entire area in almost every single matchup, okay? I have a Smurf video that's on my YouTube where I played Venomancer and I talked about, like, the thought process that goes into Venom. I, like, highly recommend you watch it before you play. But the cool thing about Venom is he can kind of buy whatever the fuck. Like, his items are whatever. It's like, do I need to kill them? Do I need to live? Do I need to help my team? Do I need to do damage? Do I need to push towers? Like, you can actually buy almost any item in the game on Venno, and it wouldn't be unrealistic. So I think what it'll help you do is worry about the map as a whole because you're no longer thinking about using a stun or playing for a pickoffs or anything like that. And it'll also help you be, like, realizing what problems your team has in the game. Because Venomancer is one of those offlaners that his whole idea of his items is to just fix whatever the other heroes can't buy. You know, did you need a spirit vessel because nobody else could kill the timber saw or the elk? Did you need, you know, a sheep stick because you guys didn't have any stuns? Did you need uh, sustain like greaves and pipe because your team couldn't build any? Yeah, it's like your hero can do literally anything. Um, I honestly think he's a great hero to learn the game on. Does he sound boring to you? Like from what I just listed, I actually don't know. Maybe he sounds boring. No, I've seen. I've seen. I think I've seen the video. I may okay. see it. I may watch it again to get a refresher. But yeah, I know he has a. His Q is like a slow. His W is a uh, poison passive. He has wards, and his ulti is like an AOE poison. Yeah, I think so you I, should, I've seen him. Around. I think you should. I think you should. I think you should try him. I actually would be curious what your feedback is on whether or not you enjoy the hero. I'm just reiterating that if you survive the first three or four levels, you're good but the hero is very prone to feeding in, like, the first couple levels. The reason why is because he has low base damage and low base move speed, okay? So he's, like, slow, and he doesn't do much damage super early. But with, like, a few points in his second spell um, and, like, one point Gale, and then, like, as you get more and more points in your spells, you just kill it. Like, you just out-harass out, out harass everybody in the game. 
That's like what the hero does. So, um, any other questions? Um, no, I'll try Vino out then. Yeah, I'm curious to see how it goes. Uh, thanks for signing up, buddy. I'm sorry it took this long to get back to your second half of the session. So, don't worry about it. See you later. Thanks, see you. If you liked this video, please like, comment, subscribe to the YouTube channel, all that shenanigans, because at the end of the day, YouTube does care about that. You may not care about it, I may not care about it, but the YouTube algorithm does, so please do.